the photo which you have uh, in front of you. It's a photo and you will be able to find that also in the website, Save Kids Life, Luc Besson. It's a three minutes movie explaining the battle children have to do to go from one side of the road to the other side. And it's a film which has been made by Luc Besson. The fact, deaths and injuries from road traffic crashes represent a massive cut for our society and dimension should be highlighted. 1.25 million people are killed in car crashes around the world each year. Road crashes kill one person every 25 seconds. 3,500 human beings are dead every day on the road. Amongst them, 500 kids die and 20,000 are injured. Car crashes cause also 50 million injured and disabled each year. The economic cost is over 500 billion USD yearly to national government. 90% of these fatalities occur in low and middle income countries, despite only accounting for 54% of the world vehicles. HIV AIDS kills 1.6 million people every year. Tuberculosis, 1 million people. Malaria, 600,000. Road crashes in 2015, 1.25. If nothing is done, more than 2 million people will die on the world roads each year by 2030. That will mean that road-related crashes will be the leading cause of deaths ahead of HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Today, it is already the leading cause of deaths for young people from 15 to 29 years old. The SDG target is to half the level of fatalities and injured by 2020. The FIA Federation Internationale de l'Automobile, we have two pillars. One is well known as being the regulator and legislator of motorsport. The other one is to host mobility organization, automobile association all around the world. And motorsport is a sort of road safety laboratory. The number of fatalities and accidents on motorsport has decreased dramatically. If we take Formula One, around the year 70s, we had about three to four fatalities every year. And now, in 20 years, we had one unfortunate, only one fatality. Professional drivers are trained to the highest standards. Infrastructure is designed to protect the drivers. Vehicles are safe protect the driver in case of a collision, are connected with a team of engineers. And that's a perfect example of connected technology, which is currently used in the virtual, virtual safety car. It is reported that human behavior is responsible for 90% of road accidents. It's a figure coming from NHTSC in the States. The safe system approach aims for a road system that takes human errors into account and is designed around five key pillars. Road safety management, training and education, infrastructure, vehicle safety, and post-crash care. New innovative opportunities are on the horizon. Intelligent transport system and automated technology can drastically reduce the number of accidents caused by a human error. These technologies can even prevent accidents from happening, happening in the first place. Several nations have announced an upgrade of their intelligent transport system infrastructure. Recently, President Obama announced that the US will invest four billion in the next 10 years to accelerate the adoption of safe vehicles automation. A revolution in the mobility sphere is happening with new models shaping the sector, like you have all heard about Uber and BlaBlaCar. We also need to ensure that new technologies are widely deployed in all markets, that they are accessible and affordable. Road-related fatalities continue to rise rapidly in emerging and low-income economies. And we need to accelerate the implementation of these technologies in these nations. Last November 11th, we launched in New York under the leadership of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the high-level panel for road safety. And 
road safety is not a national issue. It is a global challenge. And the key question is what to do now. And putting leaders together should allow us to give a priority of this pandemic as it has been done for other pandemics like HIV, malaria, or tuberculosis, or more recently for Ebola. And the panel will support the setting up of a UN Global Fund for Road Safety, specific in country projects, regional observatories for road safety, as well as awareness raising activities on key messages. An example of innovative funding could be implementing a mechanism to collect a contribution per car sale going towards road safety improvement. Businesses, as part of their corporate social responsibility strategies, have an important role to play in that respect. The time is right for the private sector to join forces with UN agencies, non-governmental groups, regional development banks like IDB, international organizations to scale up interventions that have proven to be effective to save life. When we speak about connectivity and technology as a solution to address road safety today, we must not forget that in developing and emerging nations, the situation is very different. People don't even know that a safety belt does exist and that they need to put one helmet. The average age of the fleet around those developing countries is between 30 to 60 years old age. And in a developed country like France, you will be surprised to know that the average age is nine years. So now I'm happy to ask my colleagues to take the floor. As John mentioned, this is a, a huge issue. Uh, certainly in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is largely where, where we do uh, our work as a development bank. It is even more acute, the problem of road safety in emerging countries as compared to developed countries, because the safety measures that he was uh, alluding to uh, are much stronger in developed countries as opposed to emerging countries. In the case of Latin America, it's 120,000 uh, deaths a year. And this is a, a staggering number because if you compare, it works something like 17 and a half uh, uh, persons per 100,000. And that's a number in terms of if you looked at any security measure in any one city is way above uh, the median average. Now, who are most of the victims? The mo most of the victims are young people uh, under 30 and equally are mostly people who are not necessarily involved in the accidents themselves but are uh, on the side of roads or are crossing roads as this amazing documentary uh, points. So what is our work uh, being concentrated on? Uh, being that most of the, of the users are vulnerable users, as I was saying, at least 50%, and being that this is such an important area that is now part of the Sustainable Development Goals, our work is to begin to do the development work that we do in, the, in things like construction of roads and put a set of standards that have road safety included in them. And this is how to connect to first responders, how to get data collection and analysis, uh, which I know Martin is going to speak to, but data collection of being able to quickly respond to where an accident happens. Many of the people that die in road accidents, could, their lives could have been saved if there was a quick response and a capability to, to get to the area. Equally, uh, the standards of cars, something that uh, FIA has been uh, uh, pushing for as well, and get the standards of cars that operate uh, in our cities, uh, in our countries, uh, be at par with other parts of the world. Now, Jan was mentioning something as he looked at the projection of how deaths can grow. And the, and the reason is fundamental. In, in developed countries, you have anywhere from 700 to 800 cars per thousand inhabitants. In Latin America, that number works out to about 200. As wages, and development takes place, those numbers will increase. The challenge therefore becomes, can we do more mass transit systems, how we can prevent the explosion of cars that we have seen recently that basically translate themselves into traffic jams and everything that is derived, or can this be done in a way that is planned and executed properly? We can save those lives. We know how to do it. The question is, how do we raise the awareness 
How do we work collectively? Because this is a, an enterprise that it cannot be left just to the governments, but more importantly, to how we behave uh, when we are as drivers, how do we, governments behave when they build roads, how statistics can help match this, and how the safety standards that need to be implemented begin to move there. And that's certainly uh, kind of these uh, Moses tables that Jan carries around of what needs to be done to quickly prevent uh, this. Thank you. I'd first like to start <clears throat> with a, uh, a story that starts with Mayor Bloomberg in New York City. And he said, if you can't measure what's going on in real time in your city, you can't man manage it. You don't know what's going on. How can we gather real time status about what's going on on roads, in parking areas, within a city, and make that data available to people who need to uh, manage the city. And that was where we started. Uh, our idea, which has turned out to be a good one, was to say there are about four billion street lights in the world. And I don't know how many of you are changing the lights in your house to LEDs, but all four billion of those lights outside will be converted to LED lights in the next 10 years. It will happen, all four billion. And so at the same time that we change that fixture from the old technology to LED, we enable sensors to be installed that allow the light to be knowledgeable about what's going on around it. We take all that information, we bring it back into the cloud, and then we've written uh, an API, a programming language, so just like a phone, there will be thousands of applications that make use of that information. So, there are many, many applications around security and surveillance and parking and so on, but I'd like to focus on what this technology can enable for safety. So the first point I'd make is that consumers don't have to make a choice. They don't have to buy a new expensive car. They don't have to buy a new technology to take advantage of this. If the city installs the infrastructure, it's there. So there are a couple of things we can do. First of all, <clears throat> from a knowledge perspective, we can do a number of things. We know where there are accidents. We know what an accident looks like. There's very uh, powerful analytics in the light, so we can, the light can say, gee, there's been an accident in the immediate area around me. Instead of saying, oh, there's just an accident, we actually can tell which lanes of a multi-lane highway are moving at what speed. I don't know how many of you have said, oh, gee, I see an accident ahead, but which lane should you be in would be an important piece of information. Weather. So we can tell how deep the snow is. We can tell you whether or not, by measuring the reflectivity, whether there's ice on the road. We can tell you whether there's flooding. Um, it is possible uh, that we can also analyze the behavior of the cars to develop a model that would say, this particular car is behaving as if the driver is drunk for instance. So there's a lot of things that we can do about getting situational knowledge. Jean's comment about F1 safety. When you think about an F1 track, you've got spotters and observers all around the track, so you have complete situational awareness about what's going on at any point in time. The next part of that is then they have a system of flags and driver communication so they can let the drivers know what's going on. Now let's talk about what these lights can do. So we can use the lights as a signaling device. We can flash the lights if there's a problem ahead. We can combine the information that we gain with traffic control. So if emergency responders are trying to get to the scene of an accident, we can actually change and control the, light, the traffic light system to help move traffic in the right direction. So there's a lot we can do in terms of signaling. And then, of course, there's convenience. So find, helping people find uh, parking, for instance, which would reduce the amount of cars that are in any particular area at a, at a point in time. The overall idea would be that with all this knowledge of the situation on the roads, we can get uh, we can reduce pedestrian and traffic deaths. There's a, a program in the United States called Vision Zero, which is 25 cities have signed up to say that we will have zero pedestrian deaths uh, within two years. And our technology is an important part of many of their programs because the first thing they want to know is, well, where do pedestrians die and what's going on when that happens? I think it's going to be a very important piece of infrastructure and technology that contribute to this problem. So maybe a question for, for, for the three of you. Uh, what makes you think that uh, we might make a difference going forward? What is different today that makes us optimistic uh, for the future? And to use your, your image, 
maybe thanks to your influence, we will choose the right lane to go right where we are needed to make a difference. Jean? Louis mentioned that we know what to do. It's around education. It's uh, around uh, law enforcement. It's around infrastructure, mm -hmm. vehicles, and uh, post-crash care. So if we do apply those measures, uh, as it has been done in some uh, developed countries, you take the example of France. In the uh, years uh, 1970s, you had about 18,000 fatalities every year on the roads. 45 years later, you have just above 3,000. When I say just above, it's already mm -hmm. very big, but compared to 18, I mean, it's a significant improvement with three times more vehicles on the roads. So why? Simply it, because it was a decision to address the problem. And um, we need to convince the government, we need to convince the global community that road safety is essential. I mean, it's very surprising because, um, I mean, a lot of people in the society don't consider road crashes. You know, you speak about other pandemic, you speak, uh, I, I was mentioning earlier Ebola. When Ebola appeared, it was really a mobilization of the whole society with a lot of money which was engaged. And it has contributed to make a significant step to address this pandemic. On road crashes, I would say it's kind of business as usual. Unless it does affect people who are close to you and then you start to be interested. So we must make sure that road crashes around the world is taken as a priority. And then, of course, you need to apply the program. And of course, from one country to another one, things are different. I mean, in Latin America, one extraordinary job has been done through a regional office, and Luis knows it well, which is called Wazevi. And it's something we have been uh, discussing, uh, as you know, in a, a panel to try to uh, initiate some uh, regional road uh, safety offices in Africa, in Middle East, in uh, Asia, to be able to divide the problem through the regions, which, uh, I mean, are, are facing different problems, as we, the, we mentioned uh, earlier make a, a kind of priority plan as well, because you cannot address everything at the same time. So you must prioritize that. I mean, the target we are mentioning, by 2020 to half, 12 it, which is a very ambitious target. So how you will start? I mean, simply, we start by education. And I mean, a, a lovely photo here last week, we asked for one audience with the Pope, and we asked him, please, help us to fight this pandemic. And I mean, he, 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 he was holding, I mean, si simple rules. Put your safety belt, put your helmet, don't use your phone when you are driving, don't drink and drive, and don't, don't overspeed. If you will apply those simple measures, I mean, you will halve by 2020 the number of fatalities. So it's very important to address each category of what needs to be done and then make sure that each single government will take that on board. Argentina is a good case because it points to the fact that it's doable. In a space of uh, four years, Argentina was able to drop uh, the numbers of deaths because of road safety by about 15%, and they continue uh, to bring this number down. What did they do? Certainly raise the awareness and, and follow uh, the conversation in civil society along the lines of, of the things that Jan just mentioned, the seat belt, the helmets, made it mandatory, uh, and you know, the, the drinking, the driving, the punishment of people who, who are infringing in these laws. And on the other hand, concentrate a lot on how roads are built uh, and how the data collection is done. Because the data collection to something that Hugh was mentioning is not very good. Uh, you know, we have at the bank have supported uh, in countries from Jamaica uh, all the way down to Argentina in ways to improve the data collection, which begins a process by which you can target more clearly where you can have this level of improvements. And so uh, this is the, the road forward. I think if a country takes this on in a passionate way, 
and in, a, in society as a whole, uh, for instance, in Argentina, some of the uh, you know, soccer players and others, you know, uh, race car drivers, because as Hugh, Hugh was saying, you know, think back of the years, uh, and this is something Jan knows very well, in Formula One where there were a lot of accidents. It was really the standards that were developed by FIA and others who all of a sudden now you go around the racetrack and you have this huge amount of uh, uh, capacity to quickly react uh, the, to car accidents. And then the whole question of the first responders, and this starts from the local level. It is not enough simply to do it at a national level, it's got to be done by, any, by every locality in every city and every state. The big driver is security. In any area of the world where there is a concern about terrorism or safety, uh, systems like what we install, they serve multiple purposes. Traffic safety is one, but there's a lot of other safety issues. So while the cost um, is not very high, you get savings because the light is much more efficient. You know, we, what we do is normally the street lights on a highway are only lit at 10% power until a car is detected and then we brighten the lights if in front of the car so we minimize uh, energy consumption. So um, we can pay for a lot of the system uh, by the uh, availability of energy savings and other applications. Uh, the other thing that happens because the system works with Wi-Fi, you get, when you install the system, you get Wi-Fi coverage over whatever area that you're lighting. And so there's a lot of interest in developing countries to get the communications infrastructure. So in areas where there's a concern about safety, where there's a concern about communications, they may, may not care as much about vehicle safety at the time. There's going to be a driver for this infrastructure. And because it's effectively a global iPhone, there will be applications that are available, and if you have the system, you can install the application.